glasses, the bifocals, then uh, the contact lenses, multifocal, monovision, etc. And now uh, it's the turn to do the surgical management and to learn the surgical management of presbyopia. And uh, uh, we have with us uh, the, the president of ISCARES, Professor Titial, J.S. Titial, who is the professor and head of cataract, cornea, and refractive surgery services, RP Center, Ames, New Delhi. And uh, uh, I mean, he needs no introduction. He has numerous publications, loads of awards, uh, um, international and national the achievement awards from American Academy and the most coveted Padma Shri from Government of India by the President of India. And he is, of course, teacher of teachers. He is my mentor, and it's, it's, it gives me great uh, privilege and pride to you know, introduce uh, Professor Tital, who is also the President of East Coast. Rajiv? Dr. Rishi Mohan needs no introduction. He's a great cornea and cataract surgeon. He graduated from Molana Medical College. Thereafter, he did his ophthalmology residency at RP Center, followed by DNB, FRCS, and MNA, MS. Uh, he has a long list of academic awards, gold medals, and certificates to his name. He was the best resident at the RP Center for Ophthalmic Sciences Ames in 1986. He has held various positions in numerous societies and is a very knowledgeable man, a great clinician, and a wonderful surgeon to learn a lot from. Welcome, Dr. Rishi Mohan. Thank you. We also have with us uh, Professor Namrata Sharma, who is the Chairman Scientific Committee of ISCARES and uh, Professor of Ophthalmology in the Cornea, Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center Ames. She is also the Secretary of AIOS, uh, iBank Association of India, the Regional Secretary of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, and has numerous uh, publications. She is known for publishing. She has uh, more than 380 publications, more than that, actually, this, is, uh, this was written sometimes back. And of course, she has many chapters, many books to her credit, and she is a very good teacher, a very good academician, and a, a very good orator. So we welcome Professor Namrata Sharma. Dr. Ramuti, the ex-president of AIOS, did his MBBS from JIPMER Pondicherry. He did his ophthalmology from RP Center Ames, then his DNB ophthalmology, and did a fellowship in vitreoretinal surgery. But he's a multifaceted surgeon. He's chairman. He's the chairman of the scientific committee of AIUS from 2008 to 2014. Yeah. President from ENOA uh, in uh, 2015. President AIUS, as I already said, in 2016, and has edited two editions of Ready Reckoner in ophthalmology. Welcome, Dr. Ramkutti. Uh, we also have with us uh, the very dynamic. Uh, 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 the founder secretary of Women of Thalmic uh, Ophthalmology Society, Dr. Mohita Sharma, who is the chairperson and founder of Tirupati Eye Center Noida, uh, very prolific uh, refractive surgeon and a cataract surgeon, and she has done her MS Ophthalmology from Guru Nanak Eye Center, New Delhi. Then she went on to do the fellowship from University of uh, Regensburg, uh, Germany. She has uh, loads of experience in the field of cataract, uh, in the field of uh, refractive, in the field of uh, diabetic retinopathy and AMD. She is the vice president of Noida of Medical Society. And as I said, founder secretary of Women of Medical Society. And she is also the secretary of UP State of Medical Society. And most importantly, a very good friend and very straightforward and forthright person. We welcome Dr. Mohita Sharma. Thank you. Dr. Ilan Kumaran, eye surgeon at uh, Navashakti Nava Netrale, Bangalore, did MB, MBBS from Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute in 1997, MD ophthalmology from RP Center at Ames. He specializes in MICS with multifocal lenses, LASIK, ICL, IPCL, surface ablation. He's a corneal transplant surgeon and an expert in ocular surface disorders, which include dry eye and computer vision syndromes. He has publications in various peer reviewed journals and has various presentations in national and international fora to his credit. We also have Dr. Anant, who is uh, a very dear friend, a senior refractive surgeon at Lotus Eye Hospital, uh, Coimbatore, uh, Tamil Nadu. Uh, he has done MS from Command Hospital, Bangalore, and then went on to do fellowship in cataract and LASIK uh, at the Lotus Eye Hospital only. He specializes in LASIK, Xyoptics, the uh, you know femtolasic, the other, all sorts of refractive procedures and cataract surgery. He has numerous achievements. I mean, he's a very young person, but he has quite a lot of achievements in the form of youngest high-volume FACO refractive surgeon, young, young ophthalmologist award at Lisbon, Portugal in 2017. 
then uh, CME Award at Austria 2018, some award from Sweden, Malmo. Then, of course, I Beach Film Festival 2019, he was awarded. Uh, then again, at Telangana State, he was awarded Best of Majest Award. And again, she was awarded at Hometown, recipient of numerous local awards, and is currently the secretary of Coimbatore Society of, of Ophthalmic Surgeons. And he's a very avid refractive surgeon. So we welcome Dr. Anand in this session. Dr. Sanjeev Mohan, a dear friend, did his fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons, Glasgow, MS from Karnataka University, MBBS from SMS Medical College, Jaipur, and has advanced surgical training from Scotland, UK. He's in, been invited as a guest speaker at several national and international conferences, and he's the examiner for FRCS exams held at Mohan Institute, New Delhi. Welcome, Dr. Mohan. Uh, I have with me uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee, who is the treasurer of Iskaris and director and senior consultant, Mukherjee Eye Clinic, New Delhi. He's also a visiting professor at Peenberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University, Chicago, USA. He's an established phaco and cornea surgeon and a very dear friend and a very good orator, very knowledgeable person. And myself, Dr. Rajesh Sinha, the Honorary General Secretary of Iskaris and Professor uh, in the cornea and refractive surgery services at RP Center Ames. So before we actually begin the session, I will request our uh, President Iskaras Prasad to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Rajesh, and uh, good evening to all our friends, especially the, all the speakers and panelists and people who are joining uh, with uh, uh, through our uh, website. And this is a topic which we initiated last to last week and press biopia I think requires a, a tremendous boost for all of us for young ophthalmologists to go through the concept of correcting press biopia which may be medically and it may be surgically also. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure uh, it's going to be a, a large volume uh, surgery for ophthalmologists in future because we have a huge number of people who are in a press biopic age and the corrections are required for almost everybody, which may be a just simple uh, glasses, or it may be a contact lenses, or a various surgical approach, which we are going to talk today. And in future, there may be some sort of medical approach also, which might help us to uh, elevate the problems of uh, people who are getting into press biopia. I think that's the age where most difficulty is appreciated by people. And uh, we need to have all the approaches, all the uh, right way to tackle the problems of uh, the society for press biopia. I'm very happy that uh, we have initiated this uh, weekly uh, webinars and press biopia. We have taken up uh, one of the important uh, topics to be covered to begin with. And subsequently also we'll again look into various other aspects of topics which are required to be discussed in this forum. Thank you both uh, Namrata and Rajesh for getting this uh, webinars into a weekly mode. I, I'm aptly supported by other members, especially Rajiv and Rishi. I think uh, we are going to do a lot of hard work to improve our uh, scientific uh, contents. I think Rajesh, we can uh, start with the program. Thank you, sir. So uh, basically we have uh, a lot of uh, management options, surgical options in presbyopia, but we just took three options which are quite an established and well accepted uh, everywhere worldwide. And so we wanted to uh, send this message that these are the established modalities. And let's start with the uh, first modality and that is press by LASIK, which will be discussed by uh, Dr. Mohita Sharma, who has a lot of experience uh, in terms of, uh, in the field of uh, refractive procedure, in the field of uh, LASIK in cases of press by Dr. Mohita Sharma, please. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh, and uh, good evening, everybody. Very happy to be here in this webinar and to be talking about this important topic. As Prof Professor Titial just said, it is a very important topic in today's date, and it needs a lot of discussion, and uh, everybody needs to be involved in these discussions. Uh, press by LASIK is something which I started doing around six years back. At that time, there was a lot of apprehension about this, and a lot of people were questioning uh, questioning and the and the common question that I used to hear was, does it actually work? So today, six years down the line, most people believe that it actually works and it has taken is it has been accepted and established as a modality. And so let's talk about 
expressed by LASIK more in details. So I start by saying that all press biopia treatments, current as well as and new solutions are compromises and we need to find the most suitable procedure for each patient and we are yet uh, not, we have yet not reached a perfect solution and we are still looking for a perfect solution. But yes, it is better than what we used to be doing previously and which some of us still do and that is monovision. Because in monovision, there is so much of difference between the two eyes uh, that the stereopsis, binocular vision, fusion is all, all compromised. Uh, so most of the press biopic platforms, press by LASIK plat platforms, they work on a hybrid approach. In this hybrid approach, they work on a micro monovision concept, which means that the difference between the two eyes, uh, the dominant and non-dominant eye is much less than what we are doing in monovision. One eye is made it better for distance and the, the dominant, which is the dominant eye and the non-dominant eye is made better for near, but ultimately it's a micro monovision. And hence, since it's a micro monovision, stereopsis is not lost and the patient does better. And this is combined with a uh, with most of these modalities, combine it with creating a multifocality on the cornea. And, uh, and we have to choose an appropriate proportion of the two methodologies in any of these platforms as per the need of the patients. And hence, planning of treatment becomes very important. And most of these methodologies, they work on kind of a common principle of creating a multifocality on the cornea. So these are the various uh, press by LASIK options that are available. There is a central press by LASIK, which is there in AMO VizX, in press by Max by Schwind, Amaris, uh, in uh, Supra Core by Bosch and Long. There is a peripheral press by LASIK, and there are there is an option of laser blended vision, which is there in press Beyond, which is in size and and in custom Q approach. So let's talk about central press by LASIK. Central press by LASIK is the press by LASIK uh, uh, platform, which is, is, is the press by LASIK, which is most commonly done because this is the most physiological one. And I'll come to it in the subsequent slide as to why it is more most physiological. In this, there is a cent the central area is hyperpositive and it is used for near vision, whereas the peripheral cornea is used for distance vision. This can be performed in both myopic as well as hypermetropic eyes, as well as in emetropes. In myopes, there is a minimal ablation of corneal tissue at the center. In fact, in any of these press by LASIK treatments where we are creating a multifocality on the cornea, important thing is that we are uh, ablating very little amount of tissue, somewhere in the tune of uh, 10 to 12 or maximum 14 microns of the tissue. And... Uh, uh, so this is showing the central press by LASIK corneal profile. You can see a central steepening. And the principle in all these central press by LASIK treatment is that a central bump is created. And this central bump works for near. And uh, the principle is that, uh, that when we are viewing anything for near, then our pupil constricts. And so the central three millimeters becomes more active. But when we are viewing anything for distance, uh, the pupil dilates and when the pupil dilates, then three to six millimeters will also will become more active and this will, uh, this will be used for distance. So central three millimeters where we create the bump is for near and three to six millimeters or a mid peripheral area is for um, distance vision. And in between there is a intermediate zone. Uh, and uh, most of these platforms have now a smooth transition in the intermediate zone and hence hardly any studies and in fact in our experience also we have not seen any patients who have complained who have uh, complained of glare and halos because ultimately whenever we talk about the central press by lasik uh, uh, treatment uh, the question that comes to our mind is this is create like creating multifocality on the cornea so there is likely to be glare halos and loss of contrast but uh, but in in practicality, in all the studies, as well as in our experience, we have hardly seen any of these things. We have not seen any glare halos, patients complaining of glare halos or loss of contrast. And this is probably because this is just a single ring compared to multifocal or trifocal lenses where there are multiple rings. So, so this may be the reason and that's what is our assumption. Now, I said more physiological because, uh, because when we are reading, as I just said, when we are reading pupil constricts, so it becomes the central area which is active. So compared to a peripheral uh, press by LASIK, central press by LASIK becomes a more physiological thing. And most of our platforms today are based on central press by LASIK uh, uh, 
central plus biolysis treatment. So, uh, so uh, but the flip side is that when the patient is viewing for distance uh, and the pupil is uh, a little dilated, it's the central portion, the rays are also passing through the central portion. Hence, there is always likely to be uh, some compromise in distance vision. And hence, in press by LASIK treatment, we always talk about one line or two line loss for distance vision. And this is what we also counsel to the patient always, that you may have a one line or a two line loss. And this line loss is generally planned in such a manner that this happens in the non-dominant eye. A dominant eye, we always try to make uh, almost perfect for distance. Uh, the peripheral press by LASIK, um, as I said, central cornea is used for, it is just the opposite. Central is used for distance vision and peripheral is, uh, uh, is uh, ablated in such a way that a negative spherical aspherity is uh, created to increase the depth of field and this is used for near vision. Again, this is also pupil dependent and if there is a meiosis or if there is a meiotic pupil or there is a positive spherical aberration, the near vision effect will become compromised. So this is a, a modality which is not much used now. Now, in the treatment approach, we have to remember a few things whenever we talk about press by LASIK. First of all, this is a temporary measure because this is a this is a one time procedure we do. Now, uh, the uh, ideal age uh, we consider for this procedure is between forty to fifty five years of age because this is because in most of these procedures. In fact, in all of these procedures, we correct up to 1.75 to 2 diopters of, uh, of press biopia. So we always tell the patient this is kind of a temporary measure for about 5, 10 or 15 years where you would be uh, kind of uh, spectacle independent. But once you go above 55, so say you reach 60 or 65, even at that time, if you have a power of say plus three, plus 1.75 to two has already been treated. So what you would need is one to 1.25. Hence your spectacle dependence would be much less than what it would have otherwise been if you had not undergone the procedure. Secondly, as I said before, we have to explain to the patient that this is a trade-off between the near and the distance vision. Uh, one eye will be better for distance and the other eye will be better for near. But when you, when you see binocularly, you would be good for both distance as well as near. Uh, and... Uh, uh, so, the, uh, so this extensive counseling is important and, uh, uh, and we have to do a patient selection just as we do in any uh, patient of uh, trifocal or multifocal lenses. Uh, in patient selection, as I already said, 40 to 55 years is an ideal age group. Uh, no lenticular changes is important because if there are lenticular changes, then you might as well do a cataract surgery and put a trifocal lens rather than doing this procedure. Uh, it is best to have minimal aberrations and dysfunctional lens. This is what literature says, but we did a study and we found that whatever aberrations are induced uh, after press by LASIK, they are very temporary. And after three months, all the aberrations had kind of stabilized and patient did not have much of a problem with this. Pupil size is important because this is a pupil dependent procedure. So we take a cutoff value in all these platforms for a minimum pupil size. We also check how it dilates, whether it dilates centrally or eccentrically, whether um, it dilates sluggishly or briskly because all this is going to make a difference. It if it dilates sluggishly, the patient is, will not be a very happy patient. Angle kappa all obviously becomes very, very important in such cases. And if we have the facility to measure angle kappa, it is important and we take a um, cutoff of less than four for angle kappa before we take up the patient. And uh, some machines also have the option of uh, changing the aiming beam. And if you can change the position of the aiming beam, to some extent, you can, uh, you can kind of ward off angle kappa and four to eight, and an angle kappa of four to eight may also be taken as, we are, uh, and this is what we are doing. Ocular surface becomes important uh, because if, it's a, if there's a dry eye, increased depth of focus causes loss of contrast and corneal aberrations also cause a loss of contrast. So there may be a added loss of contrast. Patient expectations are important. They have to be told that this, this is kind of temporary. This is kind of independence from, it is kind of um, being less dependent on glasses and there will be some loss of distance vision if you keep checking your eye one by one instead of seeing binocularly. Let's look at some of the platform planning because uh, planning becomes the most important uh, thing whenever we talk about uh, uh, press by LASIK. Let's take the first one, Supracore 
treatment planning. Now, uh, in this, in hyperopic patients, generally a bilateral treatment approach is done, which means that in the dominant eye, a mild treatment or a soft treatment is done, where we give a near add of 1.25 to 1.5. And in the, dom- in the non-dominant eye, a regular treatment or a standard treatment is done, where we give a higher near add of plus two, which means we make it better for near. Uh, if it is a case of myopia, there also we can do this press by LASIK, but we generally tend to follow a monolateral treatment approach, which means that in the dominant eye, we just do a LASIK, make it good for, make it perfect for distance. And in the non-dominant eye, we do a regular or a standard treatment with a plus two diopters. And we can also do a preoperative simulation test which means that we put a simple trial frame on the patient's uh, patient's eye in front of the patient's eye and we put a plus 0.5 lens in in front of the patient's eye to simulate a potential blur. So this becomes something like a binocular vision of six by six parts, which a patient is most likely to have later. Now, for near vision, we put an add of plus 1.75 on the non-dominant eye and 1.25 on the dominant eye and ask the patient if whether or not the patient is feeling okay. So in other words, we show to the patient, this is what you will see after surgery. And if they are kind of happy with this, we go ahead with the procedure. But there are some patients who are very fussy and they would say, no, no, I am not happy with this distance vision not to, at all or with this near vision at all. Then these are the candidates who are not for press by LASIK. Now, this is important because as soon as you tell anybody who's post 40 that you want to, that we have an option, majority will say yes to it. But when you do a preoperative simulation, you find that you're more than 50% get cut off. So it is for those who are less fussy and who want a, a less depend, dependence on uh, spectacles. So just showing a few cases, this is a hypermetro patient with an addition of 1.75. And, and, and the pupil and angle kappa both are okay. So in this, in the right eye, which is the dominant eye, soft treatment has been planned, was done. And in the left eye, which was a um, which was the non-dominant eye, uh, a regular treatment was done. As you can see, the dominant eye is better for distance and the non-dominant or left eye is better for near. But when you see the binocular vision, the patient is happy for both distance as well as near. Similarly, another patient my, uh, who's a myopic patient with an addition of plus two. Now, in this patient, uh, in the dominant eye, which is the right eye, a LASIK was done. In the non-dominant eye, which is the left eye, uh, a, a, a regular supracore was done. So as you can see, the patient binocular, is, the patient was happy for distance and near. But when you see with individual eyes, the patient may not be that happy. Another patient, again, a hypermetropic, normally you would do a bilateral treatment. But when we do a, uh, uh, when we did a simulation test, we found that the patient is not too happy. And hence, we changed. We, again, in this patient, we uh, did only a unilateral treatment. So basically, what I want to emphasize is that every patient is different and you have to actually plan the treatment. Let's look at press beyond. Press beyond is... Uh, Press beyond gives us what is called blended vision. Now, this works on a slightly different principle where the spherical aberration is altered. And these are here, I, in this slide, we have also given the values as to uh, which can predict that, uh, that for a particular amount of change in spherical aberration, how much is this change in depth of focus that can happen. And this is combined with a micro monovision also. And then the brain merges the two images to create what is called a blend zone. In this blend zone, it is good. The vision is good for distance, near, as well as intermediate. So uh, the treatment planning is such that in the dominant eye, the target is zero for distance. In the non-dominant eye, the target is minus 1.5. So again, it is on a similar principle where non-dominant eye is made better for near and dominant is made better for distance. But with a combination of change in spherical aberration also. Now, here we have an article which talks about relationship between induced spherical aberration and depth of focus. And it shows that there is a high individual variability when we induce aberration. So we actually cannot 100% predict that if we change aberrations by this much, this is what the vision is going to be. So in future, if there is an instrument like this adaptive optics, which can actually predict something like a potential equity meter, and this is connected to the machine, then this would actually be a more perfection 
uh, to what vision we want to achieve. So uh, again, I put up this slide because what I want to tell you is that these all these treatment uh, treatments are there. Patients are reasonably happy, but we are still in the developing phase. Let's look at press by press by Max again, a central press by LASIK, and it um, it has um, it has a mode for symmetrical treatment, which means we treat both eyes. Uh, in a similar manner, but there is a word for hybrid treatment, which means, again, similar to what I had discussed before, um, in hybrid treatment, we, um, we treat the dominant eye and non-dominant eye in a different manner. In dominant eye, the distance target is zero and the near target is 0.9. And then the non-dominant eye, the distance target is minus 0.8 and the near target is uh, minus 2.3. So in other words, again, the non-dominant eye is made better for just for near and dominant better for uh, distance. Let's see what what, what outcomes these press bio basic procedures are giving. I won't go into all the studies, but just to summarize, I would say that in press by, let's talk about press by max. It gives a reasonably good uh, distance and uh, near vision when it comes to um, individualize. But uh, most of these uh, studies would show that uh, binocularly distance as well as distance is, um, uh, distance is six by six parts and near is something like um, N6. Uh, but it, all these treatments studies also talk about line loss and retreatment. So as you can see here, the line loss of there is a two line loss of seven to two percent in ten seven to ten percent cases, one line loss in ten to forty percent cases. So this is what we have to tell the patient, and there is a retreatment in ten to twenty three point three percent of patients. Which means what I want to and, and again emphasize here is retreatment is possible in all these uh, press by LASIK platforms, and it is required in some significant number of cases. So this is an option which is given to the patient explained to the patient at that time also. And why does this happen? Because as I said, we are just ablating some, somewhere in the range of 10 to 12 or 14 microns. So when the epithelial remodeling happens, everything gets remodeled and the, and the whole bump may disappear. And this is what we have seen in a small number of cases. And then we do a retreatment and again, uh, again the patient uh, and create a bump again and the patient is again happy. So uh, again, similar uh, supra course shows similar kind of results: two line loss in two and a half to ten point six percent cases, one line loss in nine point four five to twenty eight point five percent cases, and retreatment in six to twenty two percent cases. Press beyond in um, in um, when we review the literature shows much lesser line loss. This is something which we have to note. It shows a two line loss of one zero to one point two percent only. And it shows a retreatment uh, in 11.8 to 22, similar to others. So this is this is where it probably scores better, and this may be probably because uh, the treatment, uh, because the principle is alteration of spherical aberrations apart from creating a multifocality. So uh, so. Uh, uh, a very important slide, apart from enhancement, one very important thing about this procedure is that reversal is possible because we have created a bump that are, there are in the software, there is, a, there, is a, there is an addition in the software by which we can do a reversal also if the patient is unhappy, just shave off the bump and it becomes something like a monofocal kind of a profile, changing a multifocal into a monofocal profile. I end by saying, that there is no perfect solution till date for presbyopia and each patient needs to be evaluated and customized uh, for presbyopic treatment. Thank you so much. Presby. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohita. Very nicely summed up and very nicely explained about what are the main issues and we have to understand that there is a solution for presbyopia, but it does have some degree of compromise which the patient has to understand. And if the patient understands, then then of course, uh, we can provide a solution. So, uh, Anand, would you like to uh, comment? You have yes, a lot of experience of... I think uh, Dr. has uh, covered up very well. So, I do have experience of handling presbyopic classic uh, since the days of Supracore. I, we do work with Supracore and uh, PSB Max. I think patient selection remains very, very important since a lot many budding... Uh, and uh, budding ophthalmologists and fellows are listening to this webinar, I would like to tell them patient selection is very, very important. Early presbyop should not be selected. And one thing I would like to insist is pseudophagic hyperopes are the ideal candidates initially to take up for these patients because they may not 
have enjoyed the benefit of multifocality 10 years back. Now they may be using hyperoptic glasses. They remain the best patients for presbyl that's, LASIK. That's how we started with, and uh, they are the best patients and the happy patients. And pupil size, always photopic should be between 2.5 to 3.5, scotopic around 4.5. Myo myotic pupils should be always be away. Ocular surface should be very, very healthy. These are the three important things I consider. And uh, uh, patients who are taking huge amount of time or you know, simulation tests who are unhappy should be kept away from the presbyopic classic patients. Yes, that, you know, pseudophagic hyperopes are the best candidates. And there's a similar question that who are the best candidates, the emetropes or hyperopes or the myopes. So if it's not a pseudophagic uh, hyperope amongst the, you know, the patient who have not undergone any cataract surgery, uh, whom will you prefer first? Whom will you prefer? Of course, you will explain to each and every patient, but uh, what will be the preference with the Preference between 45 to 55, no lenticular changes, hyperopic with presbyopia more than 1.5. Presbyopia should be more than 1.5, minimum hyperopia of 0.25. And uh, since uh, with the advent of Presby Max hybrid, we have taken up a few low myopes of minus 0.5 also, but mainly hyperopes with. Uh, Sir, Mahar diye hai yar. Sir, great and made a jam do yar. Admin, can you just mute? And preferably, specificity of the cornea should be on the positive side, uh, at least uh, plus two or plus three if you're calculating, and uh, negative aspect side is better to prevent those side of people. And uh, myotic people, as I mentioned, depth of focus is already good. We don't want to recreate the surface and lose the depth of focus because few platforms works on the principle of uh, halting the focus. So I just wanted to ask you, have you done any emetropic patients also with the, with the presbyopia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, with supracore I have done. With supracore yes. I have done, it was only for the female patients whom I have taken. Mm -hmm. yeah. Reason for that? A reason for that, uh, they were very keen on uh, getting because of the cosmetic issue. And even on simulation test, they didn't feel the drop of vision to 6, 9, 6, 12. So that tempted me to do, and uh, till date they are happy, and almost it was around one point seven five. They are literally doing good. Yeah, so I want to share a similar experience that I have done a few emetropes, and I find that if simulation test they pass, then they were pretty happy. So it is all to do with the motivation of the patient. So emetropia is not a total contraindication, but it's a relative contraindication. And again, as you said, pseudopachics are the ones in which we also got started with. These are the ones who don't have any expectation at all. So if you remove plus two, they are they are very, very happy. So, and you have nothing to lose. Yes, Sanjeev. I just have a question. Uh, either Amrita or uh, Moeta, anyone can answer. Is there any particular age limit up to which you would like to do and beyond that you would not like to cross the age limit? No, it's to do with lenticular changes, not to do with age. If uh, if no, there are no lenticular changes, I think we can do at any particular age and at any age. Though uh, the ideal age is 40 to 55 years or 45 to 55, as Dr. Amrita just said. What about those patients who have undergone a presbylasic and now they have come for cataract surgery? Yeah, have, that's the, yeah, yeah, please, doctor. Yeah, I think they have come back now. I think uh, way back we did in 2013 or 14, they have come back for surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've gone with uh, zero aspheric uh, Indian made lenses, not to mention the name. So they're doing good. So near vision is extremely good for them. But I've gone with zero aspheric uh, eye wells for two patients. So, so any, any specific method for calculating the IL part? Uh, no, sir. Uh, since axial length remains the same, there is no change. K value changes, the two central K doesn't happen. I think those patients were hyperopic uh, patients with plus 0.5. The hyperopic profile with what we had done on the cornea had minimally altered the K value. So we went with a routine formula and uh, they're doing good. Near vision, they're not still using glasses. So I have not got any such patients till now. 
but whatever i have reviewed in literature it says the same as what he's what dr amrita is saying that patients are happy for near vision and uh, multifocal lenses are a contraindication it's best to go for, go in for a monofocal lens and the patients would have somewhere around plus 2 and so so they are kind of kind of happy plus plus 2 would al- already be corrected so they would have some somewhere around plus 1 there's a very basic question for you dr uh, mohita that you know how do you decide about the dominant eye and the non dominant uh we make the patient look into the make a this thing and look into the um, at a particular light and then close each eye and when it, when it doesn't fall whichever eye uh, it falls in the center of the loop that's the dominant eye and whichever eye it falls outside the loop is the non dominant eye and with whichever i he sees yeah that is the comment any comment from any of the panelists dr rishi would like to say something i was uh, enjoying the talk um it's naturally an area that we are all not uh, practicing as much and we are not that familiar with and presby lasik has been around now for 15 years it hasn't really caught on and i think dr mohita beautifully explained why it hasn't caught on there are um there are areas uh, which are uh, quite gray and uh, 50% people don't enjoy the simulation and i think that's probably the reason why it hasn't caught on as much um but i think she's very rightly and very nicely explained the whole process so i had uh, one question for her one question of course has been answered which was the one about uh, those coming in for cataract surgery because these patients are going to come up fairly quickly because the same age group essentially is involved unlike conventional lasik uh, and there are i don't think good algorithms which help us define uh, uh, what kind of iol power to use so i think a lot of experience uh, is there in in uh, looking at these lenses so my question was about the angle kappa and uh, if uh, the uh, if the treatment is going to be centered on the on the visual axis um how important would angle kappa would then be um uh, if uh, dr mohita could kindly just let us know that angle kappa is important uh, in this because uh, if uh, the tr- uh, because if the angle kappa is higher then we have to change the we have to uh, change the aiming beam also towards Uh, uh say for example uh, in hypermetropes we generally find that the angle kappa is higher we will have to shift the aiming beam from the center to a little uh, more nasally or temporally more usually it's nasally uh, so as to uh, uh center the treatment such that uh, that patient has a centered kind of a treatment mm, that's understand this the apex of the hump lies on the visual axis yeah, right right exactly any other comment okay we have a detailed discussion later in the end we move on to another very tricky uh, scenario use of uh, fakic implant in cases of uh, presbyopia there are very limited experience and we have uh, sir tetial sir <laughs> experience of using these presbyopic fakic implants so let's hear from him regarding his experience thank you rajesh uh, I, uh, we had a wonderful you uh, know uh, coverage of uh, laser procedures for a uh, remodeling the cornea for a presbyopic purpose uh moita really explained very very nicely the effectivity of uh, various available modalities to correct uh, presbyopia for a younger people i think uh, as rajesh told uh, about you know fake implants i think we are experienced you know fake implants in a significant way and once we had presbyopia options that opens another door for a, a separate group of people who would be benefited by this procedure as i started in the beginning we do have a large number of our press back people across the world who do require some sort of corrections i think surgery may not be suitable for all of them but yes even a glasses are you know not available for a large number of people across the world 
especially people living in a background where uh, they are not in a metro type of cities. So we have to really go long way to correct everybody to make them comfortable. This is what uh, we talked about to begin with, the surgical approach for breast biopsy. So we do have a corneal based procedures, a partly uh, procedure, laser uh, procedure being covered by Dr. Mohita Sharma. Subsequently, in near future, we might talk about corneal inlays, which may be a, a future procedure for a, a, some group of patients. But other area which I would cover is a lens-based procedures, mainly a presbyopic uh, phakic IOS. And subsequently, uh, Dr. Ramamuthi is going to cover the IOL-based procedures for these patients. So this is the area which uh, we as a surgeon are very, very comfortable. And our approach also becomes simpler in these group of patients also. Talking of uh, fake IOLs in press biopic patient, we do have uh, two uh, available modalities. In India, we have IPCL, which is uh, available for last almost now more than five, six years. IPCL uh, V2 uh, press biopic uh, design, which is a hydrophilic acrylic hybrid uh, lens. It's a refractive uh, diffractive design. We also have a Star Evo Viva, which is uh, uh, approved in uh, European uh, thing. Uh, very soon, I think we'll have in India. Uh, some of the, our Indian uh, colleagues have used these lenses also, which also gives uh, extended depth of focus of around two diopters for our patients. So I'm going to talk about my experience and share some of the results which I believe in the literature on the IPCL uh, presbyopic design. As I said, it is a hybrid uh, hydrophilic acrylic material. The diaptic range is uh, wonderful. It covers from plus 15 diapters and minus 30 diapters. Cylinder even up to plus 10 diapters with axis can be customizable. You all know these lenses are placed in 0, 180 degree. Near add can range from 1.5 to plus four diapters. Design is refractive, uh, diffractive trifocal design. Refractive optic is for a distance, which is in the center and diffractive optics for a near, which also gives uh, some sort of trifocality of these lenses. Very thin lens. It also has a center 380 micron uh, aquaport type of design and has a beautiful six uh, haptic pad, which gives a uh, stabilization of this lens uh, in the sulcus uh, much more than any other lens possible. The optic diameter is 6.6 uh, millimeter, which can be customizable to a almost 7.5 millimeter size in cases where you have a larger pupil diameter. The overall diameter ranges from 11 to 14 millimeter. The beauty is it can be given from the 0.2 millimeter uh, ranges. So you can cover a large number of uh, white to white differences also with this lens. So this is a lens which is available to us for, a, uh, for last four or five years I've been practicing this lens. So various uh, things which need to be seen which is covered for our press biopic LASIK also. Uh, we need to go through a very nice appropriate pre-op examination of these patients because every patient who undergoes a uh, refractive procedure, the counseling becomes a very, very important part for these cases. And the pre-op assessment is also very important, which includes the biometry and proper calculation of uh, uh, fake IOs also. Interoperative because a surgical uh, approach, interoperative uh, Manipulation has to be such which doesn't damage the important structures like a lens, a lens capsule or the endothelium or a, assist the pupil and iris and angle areas to avoid inflammation coming in these patients. I think the most important part is a post-operative management for these cases, looking into uh, the visual outcomes, the sizing of a lens giving a pro appropriate bolting in a post-op period. And other, other complications, which may be uveitis, glaucoma, cataract, subsequently in these patients. So basically, we are looking for a correction of uh, myopia or a myopic astigmatism patients. So it, has, it can have a range for a hyperopic patients also. The advantage of fakic IO, we all know, would be uh, we are not touching the cornea. Therefore, we are not uh, inducing aberration as for a corneal Aberrations that concern these patients. And if you look into a, a reversibility, it has a much more chance of reversibility. You can re implant the lenses as per the requirement for these cases. If you have to do other procedure, which becomes very, very simple, like suppose patient develops cataract, 
the surgery uh, is simpler and you can still give them a, a similar outcome as you do for other patients in terms of visual outcome for these cases of concern. Over uh, refractive lens exchange, because the high myopic patients uh, would have a, both the options available for them. And if they have a little bit of lenticular changes, they might opt for a refractive lens exchange. And the chances of post segment complications, which may be a PBD or a peripheral tear detachment, may be less, though there are no studies to really talk about this. Because again, this is also an intraocular surgery. There may be a, some disturbance happening to a vitreous base in these cases also. And they being high myopic patient most often would have uh, some problems associated with the retina also. And obviously, if you leave the lens behind, you have some sort of a residual accommodation left. So these patients may have a better benefit of the fake IOL as such. Indication uh, would be a 40 to 60 years. And a clear lens is mandatory, good AC depth, which is 2.8 is cut off. Inducional count should be better. The pupil size uh, uh, should be at least 0.5 millimeters smaller than the, the diffractive zone, which normally ranges from 6.5 to 6.6 uh, .6 to a 7.5 millimeter as such. So this is going to cover even a larger uh, uh, refractive area, pupillary area also. Stable refraction. And as I said, counseling should be important because these patients are age group where they can have other associated problems. And what I've seen, cataract development is a major concern for these patients. This, this is where we avoid any lenticular change, shallow entry chamber, and larger pupil, and other comorbidities, especially patient having a coronary opacities or any evidence of a chronic disease like glaucoma, uveitis, diabetic patient having a diabetic problems. They should be, uh, may not be a good choice for these group of patients. We normally do a, a visual acuity assessment of these patients, especially near distance, uncorrected, corrected for these patients. Look for other important areas for calculation of iron power. Other important thing are looking for a, a, a abrometry, speculum microscopy, which I'll cover subsequently. Normally the power calculation is done by the, uh, the manufacturer themselves. We normally would have to add 0.5 diopters to the near correction required by patient spectacularly and look for a, a, a suitability of these patients based on a pre-op assessment. Let me just go through a few case examples. Like this is a young patient who has minus six, minus one uh, sill, uh, near eye requirement around two diopters, minus 8.5 in the other eye with one uh, diopter sill. Good AC depth, intercellular count is good and lens is clear. So this is what we normally do. We look for uh, uh, the AC depth and the angle uh, 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 opening of these cases, which should be normal, and do a pentacam to rule out any corneal abnormalities for these patients. This is a left eye or same patient. Then uh, we like to do a eye trace for all of these patients, especially look for a, a DLI, dysfunctional lens index, which should be normal. If you see here, it is 10 for both eyes, normal. And you can see uh, the in aberrations, uh, internal as well as corneal aberrations are very little. But this is a patient who is going to be absolutely benef benefited by the procedure we are going to do in these patients. This is another patient, similar age group with a high uh, myopia and suitable case. But see here, if you look into a DLI, which is 2.55, which is already a red side. So this patient has a high uh, lenticular uh, problem, which may be a uh, lenticular sclerosis or aberrations. Cornea is relatively better and see the internal aberration is bad. So this patient is maybe a suitable case if it is a high myopic patient for a refractive lens exchange rather than for a IPCL or a fake IOL as such. The surgical procedure is similar to any other fake IOL which we are experienced with. The incision size required for a IPCL is around 2.8 millimeter, lesser than a, a normal ICL which we have been doing. Lens is uh, much thinner and uh, goes smoothly as such. They have to position horizontally. These are uh, various uh, morphological features of the lens. You can see here the patient has uh, six uh, haptic design, which are peripheral hole, leading holes. And this also uh, stabilizes the lens. Apart from that, we have a central hole and six other holes. 
these two holes are su should be towards the superior side, upper lid side. So the lens is properly positioned during your implantation as such. So we can assess the vaulting on the table if you have an IOCT or you can see subsequently also. Sometimes you can pick up if you have injected reverse also. Just to show a, a small video to see this is a, a same as requirement. Uh, this, uh, this patient is a tonic IPCL, uh, pressed by IPCL. It is normally put 0, 180 degree. Full dilatation required. Make sure your incision is made in such a manner the blades are pointing towards a corner rather than a, towards a lens which we do in a corneal surgery. Then uh, this is a, uh, you can see cartridge which has to be uh, placed with a little bit of viscoelastic which is methyl cellulose. Lens is placed into the uh, cartridge uh, interface. Tuck it there so the haptics are well below the uh, the flanges which you have. Then subsequently close the uh, flanges. Make sure lens is mobile. So this will avoid anything which is getting stuck to the cartridge. Subsequently into injector. Take up to the right up to the thing. The skull has to be taken out. Gently it has to be injected. Make sure lens is opening properly. I think at this stage you can stop for some time. See the holes are opening towards the superior side. So this is the right eye. I can see this is the hole which is supposed to be on superior side. So this is the better. And lens opens very, very slowly. I normally use 1% sodium hyaluronate. So that lens doesn't hit the anterior capsule with the jerk. You can see this is a, a diffractive, a refractive zone. You can clearly see in here. The lens haptic is pulled and rotated anti-clockwise for a, a leading haptic. It goes inside with the two movements, dead center. Again, for the, the, the proximal end, again, rotate clockwise, push the lens, haptic will go inside. So there's a simple way you can do it. You have some viscoelastic uh, there. After we uh, center the lens to an axis, because the axis centration has to be done before you remove the viscoelastic in all uh, fake gyvals. I normally use bimanual irrigation aspiration, aspirate the viscoelastic. And this is a well-centered lens. Make sure uh, that central uh, zone is towards the coaxial light centration. That is what is also important for these patients. This is the outcome which is published, uh, one of the publications uh, for IPCL, which has a six-month follow-up with a good outcomes for a distance and near acuity for these patients. Very few patients complaining uh, straight light or uh, uh, halos for these patients. So my experience uh, goes up to four years for these lenses. And most patients are very satisfied for the distance and near because you are improving these patients uh, distance uh, mainly up to one line uh, because you're correcting the high myopic patient. My patients are normally high myopic. I have not taken emotropes yet and hypomotropes. Less than 10% of patients do complain a little glare and halos, especially in night driving because these are young active patients. And in three patients, I had to do cataract surgery because there's an increase in nucleus sclerosis for these patients. And there is a little bit of a, a change in a vault which happens with a pupillary size change in these cases. So this is one patient of mine, a 47-year-old patient. You can see here, both corneal aberrations and uh, lenticular aberrations are uh, quite normal. The only thing the patient has is the astigmatism. And the topography is also normal. You can see uh, contrast is also quite good because MTF has to be seen in the, these patients also. And uh, other aberration profiles are perfectly all right for this patient. So this is after surgery, a six months post-op for a patient. You can see the total correction of aberration. So there's no induction of aberration happening with the fake IOS, which is the best part, I think, for these lenses. The vision improves. See, the contrast has also improved. Compared to pre-op, you can see post-op, the contra MTF has also improved in these patients. Similarly, uh, if you look into a point spread function, this is a pre-op uh, point spread function of this patient. Post-op also, there has been an improvement. Though if you look into DLI for this patient, there's a slight change happening. You can see 6.97 and uh, 10 in this eye. So this is important to see all patients in the post-op period, the vault, patient's uh, DLI, and the visual acuity, distance near, and intraocular pressure. These are four things that we've seen every time comes back to us in a post-op follow-up for these patients. This is another patient of mine, which you can see here, again, a uh, very less, uh, you can see, uh, 
aberration for this patient. Little coma and trefoil is seen, suitable for a phacic IOL. This is a post-op. Again, the uh, aberration profile has improved uh, in the uh, next six months. MTF also improved. So this is what I've seen in all my patients. Their contrast has been quite good. Uh, corrected contrast, both uh, compared to glasses, which they have been using earlier. So this is one of the patients where after surgery, the DLI is also uh, better compared to the pre-op surgeries. This is what I was talking about. If you see here, the uh, pupil, which is now around five millimeter. So this is the uh, bolt, which is almost 780 microns. And just the same patient after the pupillary constriction, the, uh, that, uh, with the constriction, you can see the Vault has decreased to 450 micro. So the little bit of, uh, you can say, mobile uh, change in a uh, relationship between the the uh, vault in the IPCL with the pupillary dilatation constriction. So because it is a, a central distance, it does not really make a difference for a, a distance vision for these patients. But sometimes the patient has a, a large pupil that there may be a ball change, which may uh, create a problem for a change in the acuity for these patients. Though it is a very temporary because it doesn't last longer because pupil will come to normal as such. Another patient here, large pupil, that uh, it is 700, uh, you can say uh, eight, and with constriction 360 microns. So this is slightly more than an ICL uh, group where the change in a vault is less as compared to IPC. Maybe it is a material which is a little more flexible compared to ICL as such. This is one study I found with uh, ICL EVO uh, press biopic IOL, which is the uh, lens which is based on extended depth of focus. There's a spherical uh, uh, aberration modification in these group of patients. So they have a slightly lesser amount of uh, press biopic uh, correction, which is ranging from uh, around up to plus two uh, diopter. So many patients may not have a, a very good correction of a distance and near correction. You can see 97% achieving 20-40 near vision, which is lesser than an IPCL group where they have a, a better uh, near and distant vision, even intermediate also. Though in looking into a contrast, sensitivity between baseline and six months, these patients had no change. They maintained the contrast as good as uh, pre-op in all these cases. So very soon we'll have experience of these lenses also. Intraoperatively, uh, sometimes you do have a complication like any other fake guy, which can be managed appropriately. Normally, company will give you uh, two lenses. If you have even chipping or uh, you want to redo it, you can do it as such. The major concern for these patients would be a cataract because we are using these lenses in an age group where as such, these myopic patients may have a little bit of nuclear sclerosis. Therefore, good uh, selection examination and DLI if you have access to a uh, eye trace should be a good pre-op uh, consideration for counseling these patients. Some patients do have a lot of pigmentation coming onto the uh, lens surface, though it does not really hamper the uh, visual outcome for these patients. But you have to see for a glaucoma. If you see a gonioscopy where these patients do have increased angle pigmentation as compared to pre-op. So this is one of my patients had a slightly shallow uh, bolt uh, after post-op period. After two years, patient developed uh, no, lenticular sclerosis. You can see the aberration has increased, internal aberrations. And you can see the vision is also a little distorted. So this patient, uh, this is at one month, this is at after two years. You can see the simulation vision has gone down significantly. So ultimately, I had to do a cataract surgery for this patient. The uh, good thing is the explantation can be done simply for this patient, even with 2.2 millimeter. Uh, I can just get the lens edge out. You can see the edge is lifted out uh, in this patient so that your pupillary dilatation doesn't change. And just lift, engage one of the holes, engage the lens, hold with the McPherson's faucet. You can simply pull out uh, with force. You can use a bimanual technique here. And uh, you can just simply pull out with a 2.2. It folds itself. And subsequently, you can do a lens surgery. So this had a significant nucleosclerosis patient, vision gone down distance by at least three to four lines. And uh, after implanting a trifocal lens in this case, the surgery is simpler. IOL power calculation is not uh, disrupted at all in these cases. You can do a good trifocal implantation. The patient got 6.6 six and 6 vision. Uh, and you can see that uh, improvement in uh, all the aberration profile for this patient.
So surgery is simpler. And if you require to change the uh, presbyopic near correction, suppose you implanted at 45, patient has reached 55, you can uh, redo the entire procedure subsequently also. I think uh, this is a good modality uh, for correcting a, a significant group of patients where, especially patients with the high myopic uh, patients, where uh, other options may not be applicable uh, for these group of patients. So I would say uh, it is a, a better in terms of a no compromise in terms of corneal uh, damage, in terms of corneal uh, ablations, getting a good uh, esterepsis and maintaining the uh, accommodation which patients normally have, younger patients. Therefore, they have a wider range of vision. Uh, apart from the distance near intermediate, they do have a good uh, adaptation. And I, I would see there will be a more people coming with a better designs to be applicable for a larger range of people uh, for these patients. This particular lens uh, can also be implanted in a pseudo uh, patients also to improve their near vision if they require, especially a patient who have a slightly uh, higher range of uh, refractive surprise as such. So I would say whatever experience I have been a good and the indications are uh, simply for a patient who are really not benefiting with other procedures. So this has uh, good outcomes and people should aim for, uh, especially for high myopic patients. Thank you for your kind listening. We can have uh, some discussion on that. Thank you, sir, for a very nice uh, coverage of uh, fake implants and its role in presbyopia. Uh, there are many appreciations that, you know, the talks are very good, and I would like to congratulate Dr. Namata and Dr. Tal. So far, they have presented both the talks were very good. Um, uh, any comment from any of the panelists? Dr. Ilan, would you like to say something on this? Uh, can I say something? Yeah, please, Sanjeev, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Titial, it was a beautiful presentation, and I think most of us have gotten experience with the ICL, routine ICLs, and uh, so the talk was very interesting in terms from understanding point of view, uh, whether it's regarding the vault or whether regarding the anterior chamber there or other precautions preoperatively. And you have beautiful results post-op seen on the camps and especially against the ablation, beautifully. Uh, my only question is that you had shown the range from minus 15 to plus 10, I think. Uh, and all the cases, what you had shown was uh, all myopic, sir. Uh, so have you done any cases who are hyperopic with the uh, uh, breast biopic uh, correction? No, Sanjeev, not yet. Uh, hyperopic patient, unfortunately, you know, uh, even for our ICLs, we have a very little number of patients suitable for uh, these implants. The hyperopic, I have yet to implant uh, IPCL, though they would be a good cases if you have an AC depth, uh, which is going that to- is uh, yeah, yeah, that is the issue with the hyperopes where you- Yeah, the but, uh, if you look into a, Yeah, Sanjeev, if you look into a indication wise, hyperopic patient will be the most satisfied patient with these uh, uh, procedures. And other group is the high myopic patients. Yes. So I have not taken yet the uh, emetropes and hyperopic patients. Otherwise, uh, the other patients are low to moderate myopia or high myopia. And so are they coming up with the, just the press biopic lenses for the emetropes? Are they really manufacturing? Yes, uh, if you want, you can have that also because this company can give you any type of lens because they have the entire inventory. But uh, they'll also be little, you know, on a back foot when they, you ask for a hematropic patient or low myopic patient. Because right. these are patients, they are not going to accept whatever uh, you know, little change which happens to their contrast or a little, uh, because they, ideally they are a trifocal lens. Right. So they are little, I was surprised that their uh, outcome is little different than a routine, uh, which uh, Dr. Ramamurthy is going to talk about, routine uh, lens exchange patients. Uh, naturally, if they have a natural lens also, so these lenses behave a little differently than a pseudo uh, trifocal lenses. No, I agree. Fact, whatever I see, uh -huh. the, I saw the entire eye trace. There were some, some patient had a better than a pre-off eye trace. Right, right, right. So that is a surprise to me. But I have a series of cases. It is under, under going to be publication now. It is surprising some patient improved their you know, internal aberrations also. 
which uh-huh. I couldn't explain why they have improved their internal aberrations. That's so I agree with this procedure that uh, it is a reversible procedure. Not that uh, what Mohita talked about the breast biopic classic. That's also a beautiful procedure. But uh, the best part about this is that it's a reversible and the lens can come out very easily. I have that experience of removing the eye cells and then doing a cataract surgery. So I can correlate to those things that it is a reversible procedure. But yes, it's a new thing for me to that. And as Rajesh had already said it earlier at the beginning that uh, not too many people would be having an experience as far as India is concerned. So it's a learning curve for, I think, for all of us, I would say that. But beautifully presented. Actually, other, actually other, sir, other, I was about uh, to ask you that, you know, uh, in a of cases you had shown the DLI had improved. So what, what do you think is the explanation for that? So, so sometimes, sometimes, you know, when you do uh, these examination in the eye trace, there will be some variation. Yeah. So it has to be a large number of cases to say there's a significant change. One patient mm. will not exactly tell you what is happening. Mm. Mm. One thing I practice in these patients, uh, after putting IPCL, press by IPCL, in the post-op period, normally I don't dilate the pupil. I don't want a change happening in the early post-op period. Because once... Because normal bolt in these patients are around 550 to 750 to begin with when I normally go for. I don't go for a lesser size in these cases. I want around 550 as a uh, bolt. If I dilate my pupil and lens bolts and the pupil doesn't constrict to a normal size, which can happen sometime immediate post-op in these cases. The entire refractive correction changes, especially for near adaptation for these patients. So I normally advise not to dilate pupil for all press biopic IPCL patients at least for a, another, you know, uh, six to eight weeks. Once the lens is properly stabilized, maybe if you need, you can dilate. Otherwise, don't dilate the pupil so that uh, ball doesn't change. And sir, yes, sir. not just the DLI, you also said that the contrast also improved. So yes. do, do they have a aspheric kind of a component, these lenses? No, they don't have. Uh, contrast improvement, I, I can explain because we have uh, taken their glasses uh, uh, correction and uh, all these myopic patients have a glasses which can be you know little distorting their vision and uh, because of uh, thick lenses and okay. once you correct the refractive error sometimes their contrast may improve so you mean the uh, optical yes. quality of lenses better than what we were using in spectacles that is true yeah dr Amr, Amr, what you said? dr Amr, this, sir you wanted to say something yeah excellent presentation dr Chityal. i mean just uh, very comprehensive just had a doubt uh, um you said that I mean these come in multiple lag powers. I think yeah. one point five, two point five, three point five. Yes, up to four diapters. Yeah. So I was just wondering, have you ever tried using a one point five ad in one and the two point five ad in the other? Is something like taking care of? We have just started using these lenses, and I've been thinking about it. You know, that would take care of intermediate vision in one eye and near vision in the other. That's a very good point. Uh, till date, uh, I've been using a similar ad power for both eyes. Despite having a you know, little refractive difference in two eyes also, I've insisted on a similar power in these cases. Because as such, we are going to make uh, emotropia uh, for a distance for these patients. So therefore, I did not change the near ad for these patients. But that can be thought about. Maybe, maybe we can make a little you know, uh, difference in two eyes, which will again enhance their, you know, like a mini micro vision. The, but uh, they do have a good intermediate vision also without making any uh, change. The problem is the uh, accommodative capability is going to go down with time. These patients yeah. them come at 42, 43, even at 40. Then maybe putting two apples, of course, initially it might be 2.5, might be a little too much, but that might take care of them till the age of 60. The that's, other, that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, that's why I, we, I normally go for a little higher uh, uh, correction than required. If you see my patient, if they are around 43 to 47, again, there I go for plus two because they are immediately going to have, uh, going to get a little more correction required. So rather than going for a little under correction, I go for a little higher correction so that I can cover them for next uh, seven to uh, 10 years. Excellent. I mean, that, that's what there is a question on YouTube from one of our students only that is it appropriate to do intraocular surgery when the amount of near ad keeps increasing with age for how much time these patients have zero post-op near ad? 
So I guess. Uh, uh, Rajesh, uh, what are uh, what I have seen uh, normally, my average patient age is around forty-five to forty-seven. The oldest patient I have done is uh, fifty-six. So I have a two-three patient plus fifty-five, where the ad is around uh, plus three over. And uh, younger patient, I have seen them. You know, now I said four years is my average uh, follow-up. So most patients are still happy. They have not uh, asked me to change their power. So it has a range covering up to you know at least seven to ten years. So yes, that's the advantage of yeah. advantage of having a fake eye with a natural lens. Yeah. Because you know that uh, some patient would have a, some sort of accommodation even up to fifty five. So that's the age where easily you can cover up with these IPCM or a press biopic fake eye lens. I guess a combination of the statements that both of you have made that Ramurthy sir told that maybe uh, an under correction in one and you said that you over corrected so that you know the patients can manage for some years so maybe under correction slight under correction in one and slight over correction in the other making yeah. you know my that's a good idea that's a good idea yeah. Yeah. the other concern i had was you know uh, years back uh, roberto zaldiva showed that with uh, icls uh, when it's high myopia of above minus 15 diopters and age over 40 years apart from the vaulting is the most significant factors as far as cataract formation is concerned and here almost all our patients are above 40 and you have a significant experience do you think uh, the incidence of cataract is going to be somewhat more than what we see in our younger patients with the conventional fake eye yeah yeah absolutely true uh... i think you also have a significant experience uh, for a fake eye also in a both age groups what i have found you know the induction of uh, a myopic uh, patient having a lenticular sclerosis little uh, faster in these group of cases having a you know a, a three cases uh, you know within a uh, period of uh, you know 2 to 3 years which would have never happened in the icl patients So these patients do have a much more rapid progression of a, a nucleus sclerosis, which uh, we are, which was not there at the time of surgery. So that is a point we need to really highlight that uh, they are going to require a cataract surgery. So I have told I have one line in that today I am making you uh, a, 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 a fake eye well uh, uh, giving a multifocal vision. Subsequently, if you do Uh, develop cataract we are going to, going to make a pseudo fake multifocal patient and your vision is still be same so patient appreciate that point and they say okay don't uh, doctor we don't mind if you do a uh, cataract surgery for us we still have a same vision coming back subsequent so that is what is a, a soothing line in a or counseling line so i guess counseling is the most important thing in that is true that's really true management Uh, I think we should move on, and uh, we have none other than Dr. D. Ramurthy who will be talking about press biopic lens exchange. So, sir, can you share your slides? Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Titial, Professor Rajesh, and all the office bearers of this wonderful association. It's truly be a honor to be a so be uh, invited as a speaker here, and I enjoyed both the preceding talks. And I think to round off the discussions, I'm going to be talking about presbyopia lens exchange. These are my financial disclosures, and uh, some of the products I will be discussing are produced by these two companies. I think the indications for lens removal, as we all know, are today we always knew that is cataract is an indication. but today high emetropia especially hypropia as well as presbyopia could also be considered as indications for lens removal a lens aging is a continuum it's just because the lens is clear in a 55 year old or a 60 year old that does not mean that the quality of the lens or the quality of the vision is similar to what the person had at the age of 25 years essentially you can see the much greater thickness that happens in as the patient advances and the image and apart from that there is also a significant induction of uh, aberrations in the eye and uh, accommodation of course goes down from almost 12 diopters in a extremely young age to almost zero at the age of about 60 to 65 years of age group then there is a loss of contrast the, the, in the early age group the uh, uh, lens essentially compensates for the 
uh, spherical aberrations on the anterior cornea. But while once a patient crosses the 40, 45 years, it is it potentiates the amount of spherical aberration that the patient has. So it's not just the loss in quantity of vision, but the loss in quality of vision that happens. So essentially, when the patient ages, even though the lens might appear fairly clear in the slit lamp examination, there is an increase in spherical aberration, there's an increase in light scattering, there's an increase in the refractive index, increase in the size of the lens as such, and there's a decrease in the transparency and accommodation. So hence came about the uh, concept of lens dysfunction, which has already been alluded to. As you can see over here, even though the lens might be appearing quite clear, any lens which has a dysfunctional lens index of less than five, five is supposed to be relatively uh, subnormal. And here, here, even though the patient had a six, six corrected visual equity, you can see uh, dysfunctional lens index of 2.10. And if the patient was just seen through his cornea, with the lens not interfering, this is the kind of vision that the patient would have perceived. It's because of the internal aberration that you have a resultant image like this. And again, you can see as far as the aberrations in the eye is concerned, the cornea is quite pristine, but almost the entire total eye aberrations is because of the internal aberrations. So obviously, if this lens comes out, there's not only the quality of vision, the quantity of vision, but also the quality of vision that's going to be at risk. And that's exactly what happens. Subsequent to a cataract surgery with a simple aspheric single piece lens, the same way that you saw earlier, the dysfunctional lens index includes to 8.24, that is near normal. And you can also see the internal aberrations that significantly drop down, that which results in an improvement in the quality of vision, as you can see in this E. Essentially, uh, what we are examining all along with the slit lamp is a subjective evaluation. Eye tracing is an instrument that's more commonly available, but the other significant instrumentation is also available. And that shows us that dysfunctional lenses increase internal aberrations, decrease in the contrast sensitivity, impacts the pupil dynamics. So we are not looking at only eyes cataracts, which look like a cataract, but lenses which also act like a cataract. And maybe some of these might be have to come out. In early days, I used to think that this is essentially Californian cataracts but uh, these are just surgeons who are looking for increase in their practice, looking at uh, unethically removing lenses are fairly clear. But today with better options available, better results with our FACO emulsification or laser refractive cataract surgery and uh, wonderful lenses that are becoming available to us. Removing lenses just for correcting the power that these patients come up with might be a significant option. And an important factor that you look into before doing this is the amount of aberration that is there in the eye. If we, these are the aberrations from the uh, internal optics, and this is from the aberrations in the cornea, which is quite pristine. You can see the total aberrations in the eye is almost entirely from the internal optics. And obviously, if this is going to be taken on care of, this patient is going to have excellent quality of vision. On the other hand, something like this, where the cornea is quite deficient, where there's significant amount of internal aberration, this might be a relative contraindication for doing a clear lens extraction or doing a surgery just for correcting the refractive error. So again, the angle alpha has been talked about. And uh, uh, this is the distance between the visual axis and the center of the um, uh, white to white or the center of the limbus. Essentially, irrespective of how you position the intraocular lens on the table, this lens is finally going to come to rest depending upon the size of the capsular bag, which has a relationship with the, uh, with the white to white or with the um, size of the, uh, with the uh, limbus to limbus distance. And that's the reason that any, lens, any uh, eye which has a, a angle kappa of more than 0.5 millimeters might be a relative contraindication. As far as cataract surgery is concerned, implanting multifocal intraocular lenses are concerned, I have loosened up this criteria. I go even up to 0.7 millimeters. But when you're replacing a clear lens and looking at excellent quality and quantity of vision, I, I would say that uh, making this a strict criteria would be a good way to go. What are the profile of the patients for whom I offer a uh, clear lens extraction? Essentially, they are age of about 50s. High probes are generally preferable, especially low myopes who have an excellent vision if they just remove the glasses or not opted for. And high myopes, uh, because of the significant 
the complications in the posterior segment that could uh, be induced just by the cataract surgery is a relative contraindication. Otherwise, you want the eyes to be normal apart from the refractive error. And especially if it comes with a shallow AC, where just the removal of the 5 millimeter anterior posterior diameter uh, normal lens and substitution with a lens which is just about 1 to 1.2 millimeters in the thickness does away with the predisposition for angle closure glaucoma. And those patients who are highly motivated for free room for glasses and pay a small price as far as the quality of vision is concerned is again uh, an indication for doing these lenses. Obviously, a patient who is a perfectionist who is going to demand excellent quality of vision for all distances, not, no compromise as far as his or her driving vision is concerned, would be a relative contraindication. Though today, we have multifocal lenses which are able to meet many of the demands of these patients. So as far as the choice of intraocular lenses is concerned, accommodative intraocular lenses, if only we had a perfect accommodative lens, which still remains a pipe dream, uh, would be a great way to go. So we ha have to settle down for some kind of uh, compromises, multifocals, EDOFs, trifocals, toric multifocals. Uh, basically, all these lenses uh, function in some way or the other by splitting light. And whenever you split light, you buy uh, vision for all distances using the currency of contrast. So there is a certain amount of contrast deficiency that these patients should live with. Light adjustable lenses is an extremely expensive uh, um, option that's becoming available. And this is becoming gaining popularity in the United States. I see some distance before it becomes available to us. And once it becomes available, where you can feed in exactly the kind of power that the patient needs post-operatively after implanting the lens might be a good way to go. I hope I get to use it in my professional lifetime. As far as the evaluation of these cases is concerned, I often emphasize in my intraocular lens topics that do not wait for getting, waiting, wait for getting the best of equipment. As far as you get clean eyes, you are confident about your paper medication, go ahead and implant toric implants and multifocal implants. But I think the best test for a cataract surgery, as far as the quality of lenses, is to do a clear lens extraction and satisfy these patients. So do not compromise on any of these features. Make sure that the patient has excellent ocular surface and ensure that you have pre-treated the ocular surface before doing the cataract surgery. Doing an optical biometry, I use the Barrett toric calculation formula initially to ensure that these patients do not need an astigmatic correction. Then subsequently, there's the universal two formula. Yeah, ob obviously, there are other uh, options that are available to me, uh, to us, but then uh, I, for me, this is the go-to formula for all my lens calculation today. Doing a topography, making sure that even if there's a cylinder, it's, uh, 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 it's a regular bow tie, uh, ensuring that there's no significant aberrations in the cornea, Usually, I only pre-select such of those cases which has a root mean square higher order abrasion of less than 0.4 microns. Doing an OCT to make sure that the uh, macula is pristine, specular microscopy to ensure that there's adequate uh, endothelial cell count of at least 2,500 or more. And being, uh, being extremely confident of your results in your conventional cataract surgery is important before, before you embark upon doing clear lens extraction. This is just to show you a video of doing a, a real, uh, um, uh, real uh, what a clear lens extraction and implanting an EDOF lens. And this was the lens that we had in these lenses. Essentially, we had to do a, do a bit of mix and matching where the second eye usually we used to aim at a point, minus 0.5 to minus 0.75 diopters so that bilaterally implanted these patients used to do well. Nowadays, we, what we have is the trifocal lenses uh, largely switched over to these and as well as the Synergy lenses. And with these, you find that there's, uh, uh, you may at emetropia in both the eyes. And in case your intraocular lens power calculation has been quite accurate, most often you end up with uh, optimal visual results after your implantation. And uh, this is another, uh, just a small uh, diversion that I have in the sense that when you have extremely soft cataracts like this and you're using the laser, uh, sometimes the uh, removal of soft cataract itself can be a challenge. What I find is to go ahead and do an hydro dissection through the central, it's a sextant that you have, hydro dissect also along the two, uh, uh, the segments that you have created. You, what you find is that these pie shaped fragments have almost been completely separated. And once you remove the cortex and so whatever epinucleus is there, 
then the separation of these lenses with uh, absolutely no phaco power is needed. And you can see that because of the hydro dissection being done through the central segmentation, it almost is completely separated. And there's no uh, nucleus division that's necessary. And you can just uh, do a phaco aspiration of these uh, cat uh, cataracts and implant the lens of your choice. As far as fellow eye surgery is concerned, I've always believed one of the best tools that we have in our eyes as far as refractive accuracy is concerned, that God has given us two eyes and it has always been, already been discussed. And I always uh, give an interval of at least two weeks between the two eyes. And uh, it's not just uh, what the optometrist notes down on the refractive uh, lane, but a significant conversation with the patient to evaluate their ease as far as the use of the computers, uh, their reading ability is concerned, use of the uh, uh, driving ability is concerned. And once you have this conversation, some small titration in the uh, refractive element, in the refractive outcome may be possible in the second eye. Though I find that with the trifocals, with the synergy in trochal lenses becoming available, this is less and less needed today. And real life experience is what is needed. It's not just what is uh, what we measure on the optometry lane that's important. Once you titrate the power in the second eye, you uh, end up with invariably fairly decent uh, outcomes. Then of course, this is of course a cataract patient of mine, a trans PRK, in case you end up with a suboptimal outcome. Sometimes the patient is not able to decide what exactly they are looking for preoperatively. Three months, six months down the line, in case they find that uh, one of the eyes uh, is suboptimal or bilaterally implanted, they are not quite happy. You can always do a touch-up procedure on the corneal surface. It's Since you are often dealing with very small amounts of refractive errors that needs to be dealt with, it's a trans PRK that I do. And um, you to optimize the further, uh, uh, the kind of refractive outcomes these patients have. I have not had the, it's only two eyes in a, a refractive cataract surgery patient that I've had to go ahead and, uh, um, uh, not a, a sorry, refractive lens exchange patient that I had to optimize the ocular surface or their uh, refractive outcome. But uh, invariably, I use it quite often in my cataract surgery patient. But as a corollary, in case I have a suboptimal outcome, I would not uh, hesitate to offer this uh, to my uh, refractive lens exchange patient. Uh, we have not presented this, but uh, we have not published this. But I was just looking at our experience as far as the data of refractive lens exchange is concerned in 2019. We did uh, a 28 eyes, 14 patients. All of them are bilateral. Invariably, you prime them for bilateral implantation. And the mean age group is much higher than what we have as far as refractive surgery or uh, um, uh, what uh, fake implant uh, is concerned. It's usually more in the range of about 50. And most often it's hypropic patients, 13 patients, hypropia, and only one single patient was a myopic patient. And you can see 20 eyes were multifocal, uh, 20 eyes were multifocals. In four, it was uh, diaphragmic multifocals, eight eyes were EDOP lenses, and trifocals were 10 eyes. This is 2019 data. If you look at my 2021 data, it will be almost uh, mostly trifocal and trochal lenses. And uh, six eyes, we had uh, toric lenses. Uh, along with the multifocals. It's extremely important that even a certain amount, small amount of uh, cylinders on the uh, anterior corneal surface, especially if it's against the rule astigmatism, this needs to be taken care of quite adequately. If we leave an astigmatism uncorrected, even if we re uh, hit refractive accuracy, as far as spherical outcome is concerned, these patients are quite, going to be quite unhappy. You can see the preoperative refractive error change uh, range anything from a spherical equivalent of 0.75 to 6 diopters, and postoperative refractive error was extremely uh, satisfying. It's not just bilateral implantation, but in each and indiv individual eye. This is not just the quality of surgery or the quality of uh, uh, intraocular lens implant. I think you largely owe it to the quality of biometry, and that's the reason that I, in every talk, I keep emphasizing that the Barrett Universal 2 and the Barrett Toric Calculator is a great way to go as far as refractive accuracy is concerned. As far as the uncorrected visual equity is concerned, in two eyes of one patient, we landed up with 20-32 vision for intermediate and near, and this was essentially because of residual astigmatism. That is, again, the reason for addressing astigmatism in case you are faced with it on the cornea. And you can see that uh, 20, 25 or better vision was achieved in uh, 26 eyes up, uh, out of these 28 eyes. And that I think is a great way as far as uh, refractive accuracy is concerned. 
let me just take you through a few case examples, just three of them. The first one is a walk in the park case. This is usually my indication for doing a prelex, a 50-year-old with a plus 2.25 diopters with a small astigmatism, requires a 2.25 diopters uh, at power, extremely motivated for uh, refractive correction. These are actually actual three screenshots of my uh, patients. And uh, they, you can see what the patient required was a plus 27 diopter. All the, almost all the uh, um, <clears throat> formulae do seem to match up. But I go with the Barrett to Universal 2, though I make sure that uh, I'm not getting any refractive surprise as far as the other formula is concerned. And it's extremely important that uh, you make sure that the topography is quite regular. You can see it's all in green, uh, reasonable thickness. There's no uh, significant aberrations. Uh, the left eye is also similar. And eye trace is extremely important. You can see the cornea is quite pristine. And uh, the same goes for the other eye of the patient also. And uh, the result bilateral implantation, what you find is that, uh, uh, what you find is that uh, uh, the patient has uh, ended up with uh, absolute emetropia on both eyes, uh, not just for distance, but for intermediate and as well as near also. So essentially this is doable, this is achievable. What about a couple of uh, situations which I normally do not practice, but purely maybe from discussion point of view, your post-classic patients are the ones who are most motivated for achieving uh, gain freedom from glasses. And essentially, this was a strict no-no in our early days, where as you said, you have a multifocal cornea, implanting a multifocal intraocular lens is not uh, really uh, um, correct. But when the Symphony became available, the EDOF lenses, we started using this. Nowadays, I'm using it's a very selected cases with trifocal intraocular lenses also. Mind you, this is not common practice. You have to be extremely careful in pre-selecting US patients when this for this kind of indication, making sure that they are extremely motivated. As you can see, this patient just had a small amount of residual refractive error for distance, but hated, it was a lady actually, hated the idea of wearing glasses as far as near vision is concerned. It was uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, demanding as far as uh, uh, this surgery was concerned. So we went ahead and did. Here, what I use is a, um, the, uh, what uh, um, <clears throat> toric TK formula, and you can see, uh, fortunately, there was no cylinder in this case. So you can see, again, a fairly flat cornea and uh, um, thin cornea, but you can, it's all green, green in the center, that, which means there's no significant astigmatism, no significant uh, higher abrasions. Uh, similar concept, especially in the central three millimeters, is extremely important to achieve that. Obviously, the higher abrasions in the cornea is a little more here than what we see in the earlier picture. But they went ahead and implanted. You can see the panoptics in both the eyes, and it's not absolute refractive accuracy that we have been able to achieve. And it's a six nine and eight vision in both the eyes, six 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 by seven point five with an eight vision in the other eye. There was a small. Uh, requirement for glass for distance, which the patient was not uh, uh, really did not go for it, but essentially ended up with a fairly uh, um, uh, happy patient, extremely happy patient, because we are quite reluctant to take up this case. This is just an anecdotal experience, so this is not something which that we do routinely. What about a high myopic patient uh, looking for a, a prelex uh, treatment? We essentially did in our 2019 series itself. But this is a patient which we did in 2017. And you can see the patient had almost a minus 14.5 diopters, minus 13 diopters. She was extremely unhappy with this refractive uh, power. The parents were also unhappy. There were both uh, problems as far as the marriage is concerned, as far as the work is concerned. She was looking for a, uh, uh, some kind of a correction. Unfortunately, in spite of a fairly large eye, her AC depth was 2.57 and 2.65, but otherwise the eye looked uh, quite normal. You can see there was hardly any higher order abrasion. The, actually, that for what you saw was in 2015. We refused surgery and sent her back. 2017, she came back demanding something be done for her. We had a significant conversation with our vitreoretinal colleagues, and they said, if there's a complete PVD, then uh, in these high myopic eye, even though she was just about 36 or so, then this is something that you can go ahead and opt for. And you can see, and uh, this best confirmed on dynamic B scan. And because the patient had a complete PVD 
after having a significant discussion that there is a increased predisposition for uh, rectal detachment if we do a, a cataract lens surgery on her we went ahead and did the surgery and this was the power that was implanted at that point of time it was a multifocal intraocular lens that we implanted bilaterally and essentially uh, no i'm sorry it was a monofocal intraocular lens that we implanted after the right a two weeks uh, delay the patient essentially wanted a target of minus 1.5 uh, in the other eye and that's what we did again it was not absolute refractive accuracy and there was a certain need for glasses as per the monofocal implant but it was uh, some amount of near vision she did manage and essentially i believe she's managing quite well uh, without the glasses we have been following her up for four years at six monthly interval she meticulously still turns up and we have found that the retina has for uh, till now has held on what in case the patient already has a monofocal implant in one eye and the second eye you have put a trifocal implant now we have choices for dealing with these patients even with one eye multifocality many of these patients do well but now we have piggyback trifocal lenses that are available to us this is a patient who has even the pc open with the yak cap slot me and this is an indian lens that is available to us uh, comes with a 3.5 diopter add for uh, near and 1.75 diopters as far as near vision is concerned this is the lens after implantation i think just in case uh, uh, you uh, dr tetial told us about taking out pekki intraocular lenses and putting a multifocal lens we have a monofocal lens inside the patient is persistent enough making uh, maybe offering a multifocal implant uh, secondly is also an option that's available to us so as far as lens based approach for presbyopia is concerned leave alone presbyopia even for extreme hypopia is effective careful counseling as far as the limitations and what you can achieve with it has to be uh, the patients and the relatives have to understand meticulous evaluation not just of the refractive power but as the as right from the cornea the anterior um, the anterior surface up to the retina has to be done flawless surgery most often leads to satisfied patients thank you so much for your kind attention thank you sir for a very nice in the comprehensive presentation very nicely covered all aspects even in the end you showed how you know trifocals can be used you know even in a pseudophagic patient uh, any comment from any of our panelists yeah please sanjeev uh, dr ramurthy very well presented and lovely uh, videos as well uh, just uh, you had uh, shown a slide where you had put 20 iols and uh, four were multifocal eight were edof and 10 were trifocal now each lens we all know have got certain limitations multifocal some patients complain of contrast sensitivity in trifocal sometimes patient is not very comfortable for the reading so in your experience which one was the most comfortable or suitable for the patient and most of them were hyperopes most of the mixed up the two patients with the uh, myopics so i think you know i mentioned this during my talk itself with the sense that this was actually our 2019 data and that was the time when we were uh, the trifocals were just coming in we are gaining some experience with that but uh, these uh, younger patients were very uh, comfort concerned about the quality of vision and we knew that the symphony which was the edof lenses which were quite commonly using at that point of time offered a somewhat better quality of vision as far as uh, um uh, compared to our multifocals so we did a combination of all these lenses multifocal and uh, uh, edof when we did a edof lenses then it is the second eye we made sure that uh, there was a certain amount of mixing and matching aimed at a small amount of myopia in the second eye so bilaterally implanted uh, these patients do, do, did well and today uh, uh, this year in 2021 might uh, uh, refractive lens exchange patient may, may be much higher in number and most of these patients have been trifocals simply because once you have these trifocals it's not that they, there's no compromise in quality of vision with trifocals but what i find is that uh, all, once you hit refractive accuracy uh, once you hit emetropia for distance most often both near and intermediate is taken care of so all that mixing and matching conversation with the patient for a second eye uh, surgery sometimes even changing the type of implant that you put in has all, all been largely taken away 
I feel that uh, trifocals and also Synergy, which may be a, a somewhat of an iteration of the trifocal technology, uh, are the lenses I would go for today. And those are the options that I use most often today. I, I, I just w would like to, you know, ask you one thing that, you know, there is a standard teaching and you also mentioned that, you know, an eye where an elastic has been done and eye where in any corneal refractive procedure has been done, it's better to avoid a trifocal or a need off or a multifocal lens. Uh, but you said that, you know, these days you have started putting, uh, so, uh, so that is one thing, what is uh, your overall impression about it? And the second part of the question will be that if somebody has undergone a trifocal implantation, over that, if you do a surface ablation, what is uh, the result of that? Right. Uh, so as far as your first question is concerned, it's a very, very valid question. You know, I mean, I had my... Own MA earlier, even three, four years back, used to project slides that if you have a, uh, undergone elastic multifocal is a contraindication. Then came the EDOF, then certain studies which showed that with EDOF, uh, you could go ahead and put those lenses even after LASIK. And uh, we had a reasonably good experience with that. When I implant a multifocal intraocular lens in these patients, there are certain things I would look for specifically. One is how happy the patient was immediately after the refractive surgery. If right through his life, if he had undergone the refractive surgery at the end of say 25, 26, and immediately after the surgery, the patient was not happy, was all the time having quality of vision issues and uh, glare and halos, et cetera. That's an eye I would rather keep away from. But the patient achieved hit hematropia, was extremely happy. It was only after the onset of lesbiopia or that uh, the patient started had, had a requirement for glasses. Those are fairly clear-cut cases. And then having a look, a look at the topography, looking at it, supposing it's all bumpy, the sea of green, blue, red, and obviously there's a lot of higher order abrasions I would keep away from the, these eyes. As you can see, if it's a very uniform cornea, a sea of green, excellent ocular surface, again, is something I would uh, require. And an eye trace examination, where I make sure that the total amount of higher order abrasion that's been in, uh, 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 induced by the earlier surgery, in spite of that, the total amount should be less than 0.4 microns. And especially if there's a significant amount of coma or trifoil, that would be a, a relative contraindication. So once and again, the uh, macula should be pristine. Once the patients qualify for all this, my first thing is saying that you have a multifocal cornea, you have, there is a certain price that you are going to pay as far as quality of vision is concerned. Once they accept it, then I might go, uh, I, I go ahead and implant these multifocals. And I find that not just uh, symphony, trifocal lenses also reasonably work well. And uh, so, uh, obviously there'll come a time when I'll burn my fingers with one particular patient, but it's not that my patients are all over the moon. But most of them, when they see that the, the advantage they get got as far as getting rid of the glasses is concerned, they're uh, okay to pay a small price as far as quality of vision is concerned. And uh, regarding your second part of the question, I always thought that if you have a 0.75 diopter, one diopter, and you just go ahead, even if it's a cylindrical power, you treat it on the cornea, you'll get excellent results on uh, post-operative day one. Surprisingly, I find that uh, even though you are able to debulk the amount of uh, refractive error, you don't hit always refractive accuracy with your laser vision correction, even after uh, when you do it on the cornea. I'm not really sure why it doesn't come, maybe because of the age of the patients or whatever the interaction between the cornea and the lens. But uh, I often find that even though I'm trying to just treat uh, one or 1.25 doctors, these patients do not always end up with hematropia unlike my refractive patients, there's a small amount of refractive error that's left over, obviously much less than what the patient initially started out with. So they are reasonably happy. Dylan, yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, excellent uh, presentation, sir, particularly the way you started right from counseling to what to evaluate during counseling, everything. I have two questions, actually. Now, when we look at all the IOIL formulas, they work bad in hypermetropes, high hypermetropes. Uh, number one, do you have any suggestion for that? Of course, I follow what you normally talk. You are thinking this what I follow. Number two, most of us in private practice when we start off, we will not even have a topographer. But still, uh, 
we need to evaluate a lot of things. One is the surface. So at least topographers now have become cheaper. We can buy them. But not many of us have an eye trace. Kappa, angle kappa can be seen in many uh, good topographers like Pentacam or, uh, I mean, Hobbscan or Pentacam. But uh, alpha cannot be. Any tips on this? These are the two questions. Fine. You know, um, as far as your first question was uh, ah, the choice of formula. You know, uh, I find that frankly, you know, uh, I think uh, Dr. Graham Barrett should start paying me something because I become a, such a whole trip for him. I keep talking about his formula. It really works well. And as you can see in what I projected that 27, 28 day of this, you have the Hopper Q, you have the Holiday 2, all those formula is there. So though I go with the Barrett, some of those formula were showing 28 while Barrett Universal was showing 27. I go for 27 and it's not just with my uh, um, uh, refractive lens extreme patients, even for cataract patients, there is extreme hypopia or extreme myopia because this formula takes into consideration the profile of the lens that you implant. It seems to work quite well. It's not that I've never had a, a refractive surprise of 0 0.5, 0 0.75 diopters, but most often it seems to work well. So obviously, you know, when you have multiple formula and then you get multiple results, uh, deciding which one is right in that particular case is obviously a challenge. So uh, I know that uh, Hill RBF is there, other formula, the LADAS formula is there. But in my hands, I find that the, uh, and I'm also convinced by the theory behind this formula, the practice of the formula, and the fact that now we have the total characterometry ability, both the anterior and posterior cornea is taken into consideration. It's not even the universal two. We first subject all of, even before counseling, we subject these patients to barrectoric formula. Because if there is a, a need for a T3 or a T4, the entire counseling for these patients completely changes because we talk about toric multifocals rather than just multifocals, then having to talk about it. So that's the way it works for me. But uh, most often I, get, I end up getting good results. But extreme hyperopia, it's always a toss up. You know, I would like to say there was a patient who required a plus 56 diopter lens. And uh, I did a piggyback lens of a put a plus 40 diopter and sub subsequently did a piggyback lens. And uh, in that, I, what I found was it was uh, the uh, SRK T, which came closest to the prediction of the um, IOL power compared to any other uh, formula. So obviously, these extremes of I is something uh, which nobody has an answer to. Uh, your second question was, what about uh, in case you do not have access to all the different instrumentation? I, as I said, as far as cataract surgery and multifocal or toric implants is concerned, I think any decent cataract surgeon, any good paper mystification surgeon should start doing it. Uh, obviously, if you have these all these equipments, it's a good idea. Uh, but in case you are talking about uh, refractive lens exchange, as I already mentioned during my uh, presentation, these are the two tests for a, your cataracts, the surgeon as well as the, the lens. And in these cases, it's ob obviously a good idea to evaluate these patients quite completely. I do not, having said that, I do not believe that eye trace is an absolute requirement. As far as angle alpha is concerned, more than angle kappa, that's more relevant to cataract surgery. And again, there have been multiple publications which shows that even if you have point, the uh, dissatisfaction doesn't always correlate with the uh, preoperative angle kappa. And as far as my cataract surgery is concerned, I have uh, frankly moved away from giving too much importance to give uh, angle alpha. Even for 0 0.7, 0 0.8, I would go ahead and implant if everything else is quite all right. But, and that's quite rare to have such a large angle alpha in normal eyes. And, uh, but as far as my uh, refractive lens exchange patients is concerned, still I put the barrier as 0 0.5. I may be wrong. Uh, if I may come in, Dr. Ramurthy, I mean, that was a very uh, nice answer that you gave to him. But uh, as far as high hypermetropia is concerned, Barrett Universal True stands uh, good at times. But then it's advisable to keep an eye, eye on two formulas, Offer Q and Haggis L. Haggis. Because as per literature, these two formulas often in high hypermetropia support your emetropic uh, goal much more than Barrett uh, Universal True. So I agree, even I strongly uh, are a proponent of uh, the, the Barrett formula. But then Hoffer Q and Haggis are two things in high hypermetropia you must keep an eye on. I quite agree with you. You know, definitely there are there could be situations where the 
offer or the haggis may give you a better uh, iol formula but you need a go to formula what if supposing the three formula it gives you 27 and 28 and 29 how are you going to decide which one you're going to uh, i will power that you're going to implant see uh, my, my my take on that is uh, barrett is a very good formula for routine eyes uh, even even uh, hyperops to some extent myops to a large extent but for extreme hypermetropic patients you must keep an eye on uh, hoffer q and haggis because you have to take an assistance at times one formula may not be suitable for every eye because the dynamics the angle uh, the anti chamber depth the lens thickness everything varies and and even going on to uh, artificially intelligence uh, supported formulas like ladas or uh, hill rbf might not be a very good idea uh, right now Uh, but then uh, i would definitely keep in this extreme eyes these two formulas in mind as well as the barrett no no i was I, just wondering that you had plus 56 also to operate no <laughs> yeah that was you know we put a plus and i will power of plus 56 i mean it's extremely rare to get no, rajesh <laughs> i i have operated plus 60 also And uh, I just agree. ordered uh, plus fifty eight uh, lens for a. Uh, I think the patient is uh, for a Monday uh, OT list. Oh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. non ophthalmic eye. And uh, as as rightly discussed, you know, there I have uh, taken you uh, know uh, mainly two formulas. Uh, Offer Q definitely one of them, and uh, uh, the Universal Two uh, in that uh, group. But I have, I have Dr. Ramurthy clearly explained. Uh, if you have a hyperopic patient with you, always err towards a little myopic side. So I, I have taken uh, in this particular case plus one diopter extra. In such an extreme eyes, it will be very difficult to have a hematopia as such. So I would not, even for a moderate hyperopia, I'll always go for a myopic side rather than hematopia in these cases. So which your formula you're using? I'll go for a formula which gives a, at least you know uh, myopia one diopter in that formula. Uh, as far as these extreme eyes are concerned, Dr. Tithyal, what I do is even that particular eye, I usually put in a plus forty diopter lens. I mean single piece lens, and then uh, you find that uh, you know then you are able to none of these formula is needed. All you need is a good refraction. So, for example, even though that patient had fifty uh, six diopters, after I put in a plus forty diopter. What was needed was plus six diopters, and uh, with that and uh, outside. Then I actually put a plus nine diopter uh, lens, uh, piggyback lens on top, and ended up with a refractive accuracy. So I think uh, maybe when you have uh, uh, such extreme powers, essentially debulking the power with one lens and then uh, trying to hit refractive accuracy with a second lens might be a good idea. Because I think uh, you, lenses, you have a point there, you know. Uh, I don't know how good are these lenses uh, as far well manufacturing is concerned because exactly. such a uh, thick lens and uh, they'll have a lot of abrasion of themselves. So I clearly remember the patient where I put you know almost 60 diopter uh, lens. The patient never achieved a more than 618 vision. So maybe uh, the total abrasion profile of these lenses may be totally different. So you have a point. Maybe you can uh, you can go for a you know reasonable power lens. Then piggyback maybe another option in these cases. Good point. Uh, there's a question by Dr. Reshma who wants to know that uh, is binocular vision affected after presbyopia surgery, and what happens to depth of focus? Can a surgeon operate after presbyopia surgery? So can a surgeon operate after undergoing a presbyopia surgery after undergoing a trifocal after undergoing any presbylasic? <laughs> Uh, then uh, I think if you uh, have these uh, people with a high myopic corrections, where we talked about uh, faking eye veil or a lens exchange, they are they can operate immediately also because their vision quality will improve so much. Even uh, we have uh, you no know, example of Dr. Siri Ganesh who himself undergone you know press beyond, and he operated uh, immediately next day. So there's no restriction of as far as surgery. Uh, To be done by surgeons as such, is not going to uh, really hamper them. Sir, a that's a good part. On, yeah, pressed by uh, fake implant. Uh, there's a question by Dr. Sharad Babu who he wants to know which age group is the best for pressed biopic ICL. Uh, pressed by 
he said whatever you are first best <laughs> age group is you know between 42 and 55 because they they have their own uh, residual accommodation and that uh, improves their you know quality of vision as such and they have a wider range of vision okay so if you if you want to operate people who are more than 55 they already would have some sort of lenticular sclerosis and their cataract uh, formation will be much faster rapid and they would require a cataract surgery in within next 5 years so if, if you want to give them an advantage of a refractive procedure that should be at least you know 10 year plus we talk about uh, doing uh, you know all these laser vision correction for younger people they have a uh, you know almost 15 year plus uh, you know freedom the prospective patient should also have at least 10 year plus freedom of you know whatever procedure we do and uh, he has mentioned about prospective icl so i just like to inform that you know the prospective icl right now is not available in india it has been used in europe and uh, is under approval and uh, very soon it will be launched in india as well then there's a question that can we use prospective icl in pseudophagic patients I, I told you know I have not used personally, but people have used these lenses, yeah. uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Both ICL as well as you know as, ICL as piggyback. As piggyback. I have personally used those lenses, three of them so far, but now yeah. that you know that was when uh, piggyback only sulcoflex lenses was available and it was very expensive. And the patients mm-hmm. could not afford it, but now Indian piggyback lenses are available at a very reasonable price. I think uh, yeah. those are more made for. implanting in the sulcus so in case the piggyback lens is needed i think instead of going to uh, phakic introck lens you can rather go for a phakic uh, i mean uh, piggyback lens which is meant for that place that's very really correct any any comment from any other panelists uh, yeah here we go yes sir uh, this is regarding that icl ipcl talk that uh, professor titial gave which was amazing talk uh, every time he gives us a talk and we learn more and more and enhance our knowledge but uh, i would like to ask you one thing sir is uh, uvm and this is a leading question because i want to ask you something after this or tell you something after this is uvm a mandatory thing that uh, one should do in their protocol for work up for an icl ipcl maybe mono or multifocal whatever would you do it not uh, exactly you know uh, i normally don't get uvm done for any of these patient now because uh, if you are doing a sulcus to sulcus measurement for these patients and which has not been found uh, appropriately you know absolutely uh, correct uh, dimensions for a sizing the icl or ipcl so better is to you know do a white to white which is a standard one for us for doing for so many years and if i look into a recent uh, publication uh, from you know simizu group they are looking for angle to angle distance which is now with a uh, newer generation octs can give you a very nice uh, you know appreciation of uh, angle to angle distance which is quite correct also and that would be uh, that is what we use nowadays rather than doing a ubm which is quite cumbersome and uh, to measure the actual size sometimes can be very difficult because very difficult to actually pinpoint which is the right uh, sulcus or sulcus distance for these cases rajiv i would just add one thing over here because i had done a study a thesis was done under me and uh, what we found out that with the digital calipers the accuracy of the uh, lens size was up to 80% correct and uh, taking ubm into account it was up to 87% correct so 7% difference and that to ubm as sir said that you have to manually take the cursor to the point and sometimes because of the insertion of iris which is variable you may not be at the exact point that is having said that there is also a study which has shown that you know they have done a study on icls on about uh, about 3000 plus icls and they found out that about 70% of these uh, the foot plates of these icls in 70% of eyes they found out that in one or the other foot plate was not exactly in the sulcus but on the ciliary process and they also uh, just said that probably that is also one of the reasons that because of the pupillary movement and all that you know the, the it has been said that the vault decreases with time because the you know 
uh, this uh, nuclear sclerosis. But many times the wall decreases, uh, even after you have removed the viscoelastic completely and the wall changes, it reduces uh, even after a month or so. That is not because of nuclear sclerosis, but because of the reorientation of these lenses, which sometimes they are on the ciliary process, they come back to the exact sulcus. So uh, that is what they said in that study. Great. That's great. Uh, the, now, why are you? Ramurthy wants to say something. Oh, just a small point. You no, know, the lenses themselves have been manufactured both by Star as well as uh, by IOCAR and even other Indian companies only based upon the white to white. Uh, years back, I had this discussion with Star in one of the booths that uh, whether we, we should go with UVM. They said that uh, we don't really recommend that. We go with white to white because they, even the the way they have sized their lenses is based upon the white to white. He said, in case you want to use it, the one they're recommending was the Quantal UVM alone. Maybe that's the one they tried and uh, uh, they claim that it gives a more precise dimension as far as identification of the sulcus is concerned. But as was pointed out by, both by Dr. Titial and Rajesh that uh, quite often it's a challenge even to find out where exactly the sulcus is. So uh, you may make mistakes in that, especially if you're leaving it to an assistant. And uh, I think uh, going with the conventional method would be a great way. So now, why I asked the question was uh, because I, I, my disclosure is I'm not a high volume ICL surgeon. But then I do get referrals when there are refractive problems. Uh, when ICL was done, two different surgeons, two different centers in the last 12 months, they had uh, implanted ICLs and uh, that ICL had a very, very high vault and the refraction, post-op refraction wasn't... Uh, very satisfactory to the patient or the surgeon. Now, uh, they replaced the lens, uh, undersizing it, looking at the high vault. And again, there was a high vault, which was again not acceptable and the refractive uh, uh, result was not satisfactory either. So they had referred the patient to me and I had done an UBM for both the patients. And when I did the UBM, I found out that the ciliary body was anteriorly rotated, right? So, uh, because of that, whatever sizing you might have done on the white to white was not working here. Because since it was anteriorly rotated, if I, I, I don't know whether I can call it anterior rotation or that's the way the ciliary body is individualized for that particular person. So, that then came, that thought, thought process came to my mind that should we be doing UBMs just to diagnose or pick up these maybe one in 100 patients and you know stop these refractive surprises. So, hence my question, that, that's how I started the question. Yeah, that's very true. UBM can be more, uh, definitely what we did in that study also, we found out that the UBM definitely did show a little bit extra advantage. The only thing is that having UBM for just this, that, I mean, cost effectiveness, etc. that is one issue about which people may not be, uh, you know, very about. But yes, one of cases wherein you are really in trouble, then UV, UBM definitely will help in such cases. And incorporating UVM values, sulcus to sulcus dimension with the white to white and all these things needs to be done. A lot of maybe uh, work has to be done in order to do this. And whether that will be accepted by most of the uh, practitioners, because for that you have to buy another machine, which is uh, getting expensive. So that is one issue. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, there, there are, you know, situations where uh, Rajiv was telling, you know, you do have uh, some... Uh, aberrations, which may be there, but those are very, very rare cases as such. But if you look into a configuration wise, if I do a, just a simple anti segment OCT, I, if I can measure my, the thickness of iris, which also tells you how would be the, you know, uh, space uh, behind the, you know, in the posterior chamber. Sometimes you have a AC depth, which seems to be normal. But if you look into a, a, a thickness of iris tissue, that will compromise the posterior chamber for these cases. So that can also be looked into uh, the you know, thickness of uh, entire uh, length of uh, iris uh, visible to you. And the angle uh, opening distance is very, very important in these cases. That also indirectly reflects what is behind in the sulcus or ciliary body. So if I do a KCR2, which gives all the information, so if my angle distance is good, so I'm pretty sure this lens will be rightly fitted. So if you don't have access to UVM, if you have a good anti-segment OCT, that will be a much more informative for these cases. 
So, uh, any other comment from the panelists? And uh, I guess if there are no more, then maybe we can just thank the chair and uh, say night to each other. So, uh, I would like to thank all the speakers, Dr. Moita, Dr. Jal, Dr. Ramurthy, all the panelists, of course, Dr. Anand, Dr. Sajib Mohan, Dr. Elan, and of course, Dr. Rishi Mohan, Dr. Namta Sharma, and uh, Dr. Rajiv Mukherjee from Iskaris, uh, Anil, our staff, the IT team, Bageshwar, who has been very supportive, and uh, IPCA for supporting uh, this uh, webinar, and hope uh, we meet again in, again very soon in another interesting webinar. This was viewed by many and appreciated by a lot. And uh, so, and everyone has said that all the talks are very good and very good discussion. So thank you all and good night. Very good night. All right.